It's such a beautiful day in London. I almost feel tempted to go for a little swim. <laughs> uh, wouldn't that make for a good, interesting YouTube viewing? Hi everyone, Sinead with Free Tours by Foot. Standing one of my favorite views in the entire of London. Now I'll make it a little clearer for you in a moment when we reverse it. But today I was just thinking, and we were talking with Stephen actually, we've never actually explored the North Bank of the River Thames. And I want to take you along because in every single corner, there's a history and a story to be told. Um, a lot of monuments, a lot about the great stink of London. We're going to be visiting stunning gardens in the area. Spring is in full bloom in London and everybody's out. We're going to head back on the bridge, head all along the North Bank. I'm going to talk to you about Queen Boadicea, the original feminist. Uh, and we're going to head straight up towards Embankment Station. Uh, the Sherlock Holmes pub is coming up, Gordon's pub is coming up, some beautiful parks is coming up, floating barges, a lot of history coming your way and a lot of things that people tend to overlook. So I want to explain to you a few of these amazing little scenes in the area. Now, ladies and gents, you've asked for it. It's finally back. Look at her in the background. So I'm going to give you an amazing view. Big Ben in all her glory after four years. It's taken that length of time, not fully revealed to the public just yet, but we will be getting there very shortly. I believe there's a big reveal coming up, so I'll show you that in just two minutes. So stay with me. A lot of history coming your way, and we're gonna head right up the Victoria Embankment. But well, welcome back, everyone. I feel like it's been forever. I can't take you, wait to take you on a little journey around London. I wanna show you some of the, my hidden secrets of this area. Just want you to see the North Bank from my eyes and what I noticed along the way. Some people tend to overlook certain areas, but there's some amazing memorials along here. But look at Big Ben. I mean, it's been a long time coming. It truly has. So we're going to start with the statue over here in the corner. I've never actually spoken about this before. And we're going to talk about Queen Boudicca of the Iceni tribe an incredible female warrior. Now, many monarchs over the years have been influenced by Queen Boudicca. Elizabeth I is said to have been interested in the history of the Boudiccan revol revolt. Uh, Queen Victoria is uh, said to have been quite enamored with her and actually thought that she was quite like her herself. Um, getting back to Boudicca. So it's a bronze sculpture representing Boudicca, the queen of the Iceni tribe. And she led a, um, an actual uprising in Roman Britain around AD 60 or AD 61. Um, this wasn't erected actually until 1902, but it's a sculpture by Thomas Thornycroft. Uh, he was favored by Queen Victoria. He actually did an equestrian statue of her, which was put in the Great Industrial Exhibition in Hyde Park in 1851. Uh, she was the wife of King Prasutagus. Now this is probably going to be a very wrong pronunciation. King Prasutagus was ruler of the Iceni tribe and he had inhabited what we know today as modern day Norfolk. Now he actually had an alliance with the Romans uh, when they arrived so he could secure independent status for Norfolk, uh, that area. And even in his will, he had gifted in his will, half of his fortune was to go to the emperor, and the Roman emperor Nero and his two daughters. However, that wasn't to come to pass, however, because as soon as he died, the Romans actually conquered Norfolk, uh, removed his lands, and actually um, enslaved his citizens. So the queen, his wife, Iceni, she had been captured as well, uh, reputedly was lashed and her daughters were raped. She led a 120,000 strong army of the Iceni tribe and the tribe known as Trinovantes, they were a tribe from modern day Essex. And in three different parts of the UK, up to 80,000 people were slaughtered. Now the revolt or her rebellion was eventually crushed by the Romans, eventually. So not quite successful for her, but she's lived on in the memories of several female, uh, powerful females. Elizabeth I was said to be enamored by her and very interested in the history of Boudicca and also Queen Victoria but she became a key symbol as well for the suffragette movement as um, in many a demonstration she was referred to. George Bernard Shaw wrote several poems about Boudicca but there is an actual full 
exhibit, Boudican exhibit, in the Metropo about the Boudican Revolt in the Museum of London, ladies and gents. So that's her anyway. She starts off our tour today, but we're going to head up here and we're going to make our way up a Vic Victoria embankment. And um, this building, by the way, is Poor Cullis House, ladies and gents. It's right here. And that's just an extension of the offices of the Houses of Parliament for the members of Parliament. Um, obviously, they can't all be housed. There's over 650 elected M members of Parliament. Some of them are housed, of course, in the House of Commons, the more important ones. However, uh, there is extra room, of course, in here for the um, the MPs, the members of Parliament. Sorry. Now, we're going to continue on because I want to show you the headquarters of the Metropolitan Police Department. This is New Scotland Yard. But it is, in fact, New, New, New Scotland Yard because this is the fourth location on the site. Now, some of you will be quite familiar with this revolving sign down here. Uh, here is the building, the New Scotland Yard building. But not the original site. It takes its name, actually, from... Uh, it used to be located on Whitehall Place and one of the entrances was actually on Scotland Yard. I'll show you probably now in a minute. I'm getting a few strange looks. They're wondering why I am filming them at the moment. Well, that's okay. It's a public building, so we're allowed to talk about the history of Scotland Yard. So it, uh, there it is. Now, the headquarters of the Metropolitan Police Department, and that was formed on the 29th of September, 1829. Now, the gentleman responsible for that is Robert Peel and here's an amazing bust here and in one of the several moves actually when they moved to the third location which was on Victoria they moved back to this location they found this bust of Robert Peel in a box under a staircase and it's now had a fitting tribute to him here he was the founder of the Metropolitan Police Department he was the founding father of the Conservative Party so twice as Prime Minister he was twice uh, Chancellor of the Exchequer I believe uh, he was also Foreign Secretary, but uh, years later he was referred to as a liberal wolf in sheep's clothing. Um, some relatively unknown facts about him, actually. He is also uh, the first British Prime Minister to have his photograph officially taken. And he is also the first Prime Minister, well, he's the only Prime Minister that was on the front of the Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band uh, front cover on the album. Now, inside the building as well, and that is the very familiar New Scotland Yard sign, folks, that a lot of people uh, you'll be familiar with from Sherlock and from The Bill, uh, which was a, a police, well, a lot of police crime dramas. And uh, actually, I don't know, is it featured in Line of Judy, which is also a really good one that was just come out as well. But inside here is one of the more spectacular museums in London, which regretfully is not open to the public. And that is the Crime Museum. And it was actually set up to help police recruits, um, well, study when they're investigating uh, crimes here in London. Okay, so the location of that crime museum is inside New Scotland Yard here. Sorry, I was losing my words a little bit. It's quite noisy and distracting around here. The police just asked me what I was doing, but I just told them it's fine. So it's a collection of criminal memorabilia kept at New Scotland Yards, um, which is the headquarters, of course, of the Met. It's also known as the Black Museum. Now, it did start in 1874, this museum, arising from an act called the Forfeiture Act of 1870. Now, basically, that's when they confiscated prisoners' property and they put it into this black museum and it aided them in their study of crime and criminals. Um, it was also that Forfeiture Fortune for Act in Section 31 was abolished the punishment of being hung, drawn and quartered. Isn't there amazing sometimes in the English language there's words, certain words you cannot pronounce. Anyway, inside there they have over 500 exhibits and some of the most incredible exhibits I mean I would give my right arm to see. I would absolutely love to see. Um, firstly they have the private museum has opened up in 1875 but they have a noose, the hangman's noose uh, that they used in there in the execution of the last female in Britain and her name was Ruth Ellis and she was executed for uh, well killing her partner on the 13th of July in 1955 at Holloway prison but the last executions in the UK of course were uh, Peter Anthony Allen he was hanged in Walton prison in Liverpool and Gwyn and Owen Evans at strange ways in Manchester but not only that they also have death masks from criminals that were executed in Newgate prison and inside there the infamous from hell letter from the jack the ripper 
um, case. But apparently the only people that can use that crime museum now are police recruits, police themselves, members of the royal family, of course, they can use anything they like. And um, visiting dignitaries, I believe. Going on now, today. So, here's a little history of Victoria Embankment Gardens. Let's have a quick look what they say here. So, Sir Christopher Wren, um, of course, you're all familiar with him, was the first person to suggest a river embankment in London after the fire in 1666. Work eventually began in 1864. Now, the reason this very area exists today is because of one incredible man called Joseph Bazalgette. 1858, a period in, here in London, it was called the Great Stink of London. And yes, it's as unpleasant as it sounds. So this is what is called Victoria Embankment. Now, the Great Stink of London effectively with the introduction of middle classes and flushing toilets uh, the river thames effectively became a sewer uh, people were throwing all the rubbish the dead animals and the smell of the river thames now of course with the introduction of the flushing toilet where does the sewage go it went straight in to the river thames the smell was so bad from the river thames even the houses of parliament right down the end here had to soak uh, the offices and the curtains and chlorides of lime to prevent the waft from coming through. I mean, insanely bad. Even the people of London themselves, who didn't have the privilege of curtains of chlorides of lime, headed down to, um, well, Tooley Street to get a welcome relief of the spice merchants and banana merchants and all the ships coming in with the wonderful fragrances just to relieve them of the horrendous smell of the River Thames. Now, also, this caused a massive amount of problems in respect of cholera. There was massive typhoid epidemics, so something had to be done. So Joseph Bazalgette, and we'll speak a bit more about Sir Joseph Bazalgette, he embanked this entire area. But we're going to walk through some of the gardens that came out as a result of these, and these were usually laid out around, so laid out between 1939 and 1959. But the gardens are also created on the site of the former Privy Garden of the Palace of Whitehall, which was the primary residence of the English monarch, monarchy actually, between 1530 and 1698. That actual building was destroyed by fire and with the exception of Banqueting House by Inigo Jones, which still stands to this day in 1619. But we should be doing a video on the Palace of Whitehall. But I want to show you some steps that exist from that former building that was in the area as well. But the building I'm looking at right now is the MOD building. This is the Ministry of Defence. And this was designed by Emmanuel Vincent Harris. And again, built on this site between 1939 and 1959. Now, it's great to list it. Um, it was designed by Vincent Harris in 1915. Um, but it's a combination, the Ministry of Defence, of the Admiralty, the War Office and the Air Ministry. So there are more CCTV cameras, I think, on that building than there are anywhere else in London. There's over 300,000 CCTV cameras in London. So behind the Ministry of Defence building here is Whitehall. And it's right across the road from, uh, of course, the home of the Prime Minister, 10 Downing Street. So if you head down there by the Ministry of Defence, you come out onto Whitehall, which is known as the Corridor of Power. So one of the most secure streets in Britain. So of those 300,000 CCTV cameras in London, I honestly believe there must be about 290,000 of them on this very building alone. But beneath the building is a three-story bunker complex housing the Defence Crisis Management Centre. And this is a protected crisis management facility provided especially for the government officials. So I guess a bunker in the event of any actual major catastrophic event of which the Queen is quite protected as well, and the Prime Minister, because there's underground road network in London, which connects, so they say, now I've never seen it, but the rumor is there is a secret sophisticated underground road network of tunnels underneath the Ministry of Defense here, connecting Buckingham Palace, Downing Street. And it is said that they could successfully get the Queen and the Prime Minister out um, underground in London without even coming above ground in the eventuality of any major catastrophic event. Now this memorial here, I'm not gonna be able to do them all, ladies and gents, but I will try to be respectful of them. This is dedicated to the Korean War. 
and it says here at the end, with gratitude for the sacrifices made by the British Armed Forces in defense of freedom and democracy in the Republic of Korea. Now, this one I found recently, which I find is amazing, and this is awarded to, I think it's 14 Victoria Cross holders. And these are plaques commemorating these Victoria Cross holders. And let's just read what it says. These, oh, sorry, there's 12 of them. These paving stones commemorate 12 men who were, were born in Westminster, went on to be awarded the Victoria Cross for their actions during the First World War. These included the first airman and the first Jewish soldier, soldier to be awarded the Victoria Cross. The paving stones were unveiled between 2014 and 2018 on the centenary of the Victoria Cross recipient's actions. It's right, so that, and here, ladies and gents, is centuries of history. See these steps here? These steps are known as the Queen Mary Steps, and they are a remnant of the Tudor Palace, which was once present here. So the steps uh, led down, actually, to what would have been at the time the River Thames. So the Queen Mary steps and some of the remaining Whitehall Palace. I mean, there's history at every corner in the city and that's what blows my mind about London. Right, let's continue on with our little history tour and head in to our next part. I'm gonna head into Whitehall Court and the second part of the Victoria Embankment Gardens, Whitehall Court Gardens now. We featured this stunning, stunning building in my oligarch tour because on top in the penthouse, two of the penthouses that went for 11 million pounds were bought by Andre, well, Shuvalov, former deputy prime minister of Russia. And he features on my Russian oligarch tour. So, oh, sorry, my Russian oligarch tour. So don't forget to check that out if you haven't already seen it. But here we have, look how beautiful it is here. Now, would you mind a residence like that, ladies and gents? Right up here in this stunning building. But not only that, Lord Kitchener lived here. Apparently George Bernard Shaw lived here. So spring is in full bloom in London. So I'm gonna do a, a parks tour in the next few weeks. So this stunning home, can you imagine having a penthouse right up there? Well, really we can't, can we? Because, well, it's certainly beyond my budget anyway. So 11 million and he bought two of these properties. Now he has been known to have been said that they belong to his wife, but hey, who knows? Pretty nice property for George Bernard Shaw as well though. So Londoners are all out looking, enjoying their lunch taking a little well-earned break from what time is it actually so it's approximately 10 to 2 right now so it's lunchtime in London between 1 and 2 but look how pretty the gardens are you guys it's a beautiful day actually really well and truly spring has arrived now we're going to go around the backs of the buildings because I want to bring you around and up Northumberland Avenue very shortly as well look at these little uh, table tennis tables that you're more than welcome to avail of. There's a little guided tour going on there. Amazing to think that this was all technically we're walking through what would have been the River Thames. I mean massive achievement by Joseph Bazalgette. Just giving you a beautiful idea of how attractive London looks in the spring and of course the London Eye there through the trees. Now, let's head up and around here. I'm gonna take you out around Embankment Station. But there is a little detour I wanna take. But I just wanna take you on a little detour. Let's walk through the lovely path here. I'm gonna bring you over and you'll see directly in front of me the Hungerford Bridge and the pedestrian footbridges on either side, which are the Golden Jubilee Bridges. Now, the first bridge was designed by Isambard Kingdom Brunel. And actually the footbridge, the suspension footbridge, the Hungerford, the name comes from a market. 
um, that would have been in the area, the Hungerford Market. But the bridge was bought by the railway company that extended the South Eastern Railway into the newly opened Charing Cross Station. Look at this stunning bridge. Now, I've walked across this on a previous tour. One of the first tours I took across the bridge and along the embankment. But I believe the audio isn't quite good in that. It just shows how <laughs> amateurish we were at the beginning. Um, I was still trying to catch my, get my feet at the time. But the reason we're crossing here as well is the railway company they replaced Isambard's Bridge, the suspension bridge, with a structural designed by Sir John Hawkshore. The chains actually from the old bridge are now used in Bristol's Clifton suspension bridge. But we're heading over here to see the memorial to the hero of the Victorian era. And there is an actual image of him seem to be constructing something along here. See the image behind the pole there? Talk a little bit about Sir Joseph Bazalgette. Some people call him the patron saint of the noses of the people of London. Let's head over and you'll see it right here on the Victoria Embankment. Now, Joseph Bazalgette was an English civil engineer in the 19th century and here he is so the engineer of the London main drainage system and of the embankment, born 1819 and died in 1891. I'm so sorry about the noise folks, but that's central London. There's not much I can do about that. But he was the chief engineer, engineer of London's Metropolitan Board of Works. His major achievement, as we've spoken about, all right, was the sewage system here in London. But he's also accredited with the Hammersmith and Battersea Bridges, Putney Bridge, Chelsea Embankment, Albert Embankment, Northumberland Avenue, where we'll be heading very shortly along here, and Shaftesbury Avenue. And his actions are thought to have saved more lives in the Victorian era than any other Victorian official. The historian Peter Ackroyd argues that Basil Jett should be considered a hero of London. So next I want to take you up Northumberland Avenue this is a lot of crossing over roads and jaywalking. I know a lot of you will be a bit cross with me. But I want to get back to the headquarters of the Secret Service during the Great War. And one chap in particular, but I've never brought you around this particular area. I'm doing a bit of jaywalking here. I'm very impatient. Alas, off we go. So this is Northumberland Avenue, laid out as well by Joseph Bazalgette. And let's take you up and around the corner here. So obviously with the seating outdoors on a beautiful day in London, this is a very popular tourist destination. And it is an actual must for any Sherlock Holmes fans in London. Um, it is a complete recreation of Holmes and Watson's study upstairs and their sitting room with a large collection of objects and photographs related to the characters from the books. But the collection was put together for the Festival of Great Britain, uh, which of course took place uh, in 19, oh, oh yeah, no, the Gr Festival of Great Britain on the South Bank, and it moved to its now permanent home here at the Sherlock Holmes Pub in 1957. Now, you're in for a special treat because the gentleman I just spoke to two minutes ago said it's closed upstairs, but he's going to bring us in. Let's have a quick look inside and upstairs. We'll just get a look at that recreation of their library and their living quarters. So this is what they have here. Oh, now, look at that, you guys. Isn't that amazing? So nobody actually gets to go inside because these are all preserved, this room. But just to give you an idea of the study of living quarters of Sherlock and Dr. Watson. And you get to have a bit of lunch here, and it's great for fish and chips here, actually. They're usually quite busy, though, aren't you guys? Yeah, it's, best it's best to book in advance, OK. So just to give you an idea, Sir Conan Doyle's room. Sherlock Holmes room and this is where you would eat so does it get much more traditional than that ladies and gents how amazing oh this is oh yeah there is a bigger window thank you <laughs> oh wow it's all trial and error is it better to go that side as well okay let's have a better look here wow what is that that's so weird that mannequin is quite creepy so she's just showing me here that I can come this way 
Oh my god, that's so much better. Thank you. Look at that. Oh my god, why not? All of these were accumulated and brought here in 1957. So technically, like a little Sherlock museum. Excellent. I miss this bigger window. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Okay. Right, let's have a look at another very historic pub along here. The Ship and Shovel. Now, this is on Craven Street, Craven Passage, actually. But just for my American friends that are tuning in, this is Benjamin Franklin's house here that you can organize a tour on. Right at the back of the Sherlock Holmes pub. And you can head inside there to have a view. You have to contact them directly for a tour in there. And we're on Craven Street. Look at these beautiful homes along here. And we're going to head down then to the Ship and Shovel. And this is a rather quirky pub. This is the only pub in two halves in London. Same pub, but in two halves. Sharing a cellar and a kitchen underground. How cool is that? And then we'll take us under here then, the Archer Shopping Centre. Love this pub too. That one seems to be closed at the moment. And we'll show you where we end up out here then. I absolutely love it along here because we're heading in towards Villiers Street. Which just connects us from the Archway shopping area here. Villiers Street connects us to somewhere we've been before as well. The incredible Gordon's Wine Bar. Busy day today. Wow. We're covering a lot of ground. I still have a few more stops to make. Very interesting stuff coming up in Victoria Embankment Gardens. Right at the back of the Embankment Station. So, this is Villiers Street. I love this street as well. Yeah. This place is usually packed. If you could only smell the food here right now. The Livio is the Italian restaurant. I kind of like it in there. And straight down here is Embankment. But look. Who lived in this building? Coming up on the left hand side. Another one of those circular blue plaques. I'm always telling people to make sure you keep your, an eye above you in London when you're walking around. There's always so much as a wealth of information open to you. And here was the home. I moved down a little bit. Oh, garbage truck coming. Let me pause you for a minute. Of Rudyard Kipling. But there's Rudyard Kipling's residence, of course, the author of The Jungle Book, and he lived here. He was, this was erected in 1957 by the London City Council, commemorating where he lived. And as you can see here, he lived here from 1889 to 1891. Now, he won the Nobel Peace Prize for Literature in 1907, and he died, actually, of a perforated duodenal ulcer at the age of 70. But his death, and I always enjoyed this, had been incorrectly reported and prematurely reported in a magazine to which he actually replied, I've just read that I am dead. Don't forget to delete me from your list of subscribers. So, so commonly known as well as the York Gateway or the York Watergate, um, it was built in 1874. And it's actually where the river would have met the bank, the North Bank. So the River Thames would have come entirely up as far as this water gate here. Now, the, it was built in 1874 and it's part of the York House, which was built as a London base for the Bishops of Norwich in the 1230s. However, the plaque over here will give us a little bit more information and it shows you the exact position where the River Thames went. And it's right down here. This plaque was erected to commemorate this area. Let's just see. But the gateway marks the position of the north bank of the River Thames before the construction of the Victoria Embankment in 1862. 
So the plaque tells us here about the 16th century house was acquired by Henry VIII's house and it took its name when it was given to the Archbishop of York in 1586. And again, as it says there, the leisure of the house was owned by the Duke of Buckingham and the Watergate was built around 1625. So for almost 400 years ago, this has been a place where the Duke used to alight uh, from his boat on the River Thames. So just this random piece of incredible history that people walk past every day, 400 years old, standing here with so many stories to tell of its origin. Now let's head around the park here and look at Londoners all out enjoying the beautiful day. Now I have no idea why this boy is here, but he seems to be as enamored with the man known as Robert Burns, who lived from 1759 to 1796. Now Robert Burns, also known as Rabbi Burns, is a famous Scottish poet and lyricist. He's uh, widely regarded to be the national poet of Scotland. Now you will be most familiar with him for the words which he never took claim to actually. He never claimed responsibility for it, but we know that the words were of old Lang Syne, which we all celebrate, of course, at the end of the new year, after the countdown. Um, it's also widely used in um, funerals and anything to commemorate the ending of an occasion. Now, this is quite interesting. The glorious, a memorial here on board a camel to the glorious and immortal men of the officers, NCOs, and men of the Imperial Camel Corps, British, Australian, New Zealand, Indian, who fell in action or died of wounds and disease in Egypt, Sinai, and Palestine, 1916, 1917, and 1918. And this dedicated to the Camel Corps. What a rather unusual memorial, folks. Isn't that beautiful? Right, let's head out. We're going back out onto the Victorian Bank now because I want to show you what I think is one of the most impressive memorials in the entire of London. And you can see it there in the background behind the tree. We're going to make our way out towards Cleopatra's Needle. Here is the stunning obelisk a gift from the Egyptians to commemorate the victory or well, one of the victories of Napoleon. Now look at the obelisks here. This is the obelisk. But look at the Sphinx. Now what's quite interesting about this and people don't realize this as well. This is probably one of the only places in London where you'll see pock damage from World War I. And you'll also see that on the Sphinx. That's a terrific photo there for people. But here it is, 3,500 years old. And here's some of that damage again. Let's have a look at the paws of the Sphinx here. And come up the steps. So it's an amazing photograph to get. And you'll see some of the damage there on the Sphinx's arm, or paw as it were. And the history of this is quite complex and in fact quite tragic for a number of individuals. But let me just take you down here because I want to get you a better view of it so we can talk a little bit about the history of it. Look at this as you're coming down the steps, you guys. You're right here by the River Thames. It's such a beautiful day in London. I almost feel tempted to go for a little swim. <laughs> uh, wouldn't that make for a good, interesting YouTube viewing? Right, so let me take you around here just to get a better view of it. And this is what I wanted to show you. So. Cleopatra's Needle is 60 feet high and 186 ton obelisk. It's the oldest outdoor monument in London and exposed artifact in London. 
So it was cut from granite quarries in Aswan in Egypt, about 1475 BC. Carved with dedications to various gods and rulers and erected in Alexandria. So the monument was presented to the British uh, by Muhammad Ali. He was the Viceroy of Egypt in 1819 and it was transported actually with very much difficulty in 1877. Now bear in mind, this is 186 tons. So transporting it was a monumental task. And what happened is they made a specially designed cigar-shaped container ship called the Cleopatra and it was used to convey this priceless artifact. That uh, Cleopatra was built by the Dixon brothers and was technically an iron cylinder when completed. However, on October 14th, 1877, in treacherous waters off the west coast of the Bay of Biscay in France, disaster struck uh, those treacherous waters. The needle was in danger of actually sinking. So this, a steamship that had been carrying uh, the needle, well, had been towing the needle, the Cleopatra, the steamship's name was the Olga, sent six volunteers to the Cleopatra to rescue the crewmen. However, those six volunteers were swamped and the volunteers drowned. So here you have a memorial dedicated to those men that lost their lives while attempting to rescue the crew from the Cleopatra. So the, the crew actually eventually saved the, the Cleopatra crew. Um, they, the Olga drew alongside them and rescued five crewmen and their skipper. But they then cut the tow rope, leaving the vessel adrift in the Bay of Biscay. So, five days Cleopatra's needle was adrift on board the Cleopatra until finally a ship uh, came across it floating peacefully and undamaged off the northern coast of Spain. So they sent another steamship, the Anglia, to eventually tow it successfully up the embankment here to great cheers by the crowds who were awaiting its arrival. It came up the embankment finally in 1878. So a rather sad story for those crewmen. I mean, that's what's incredible about this place. There is history at every turn. Now, look here. Also, they said about they said about even commemorating Cleopatra's needle on the benches here on the embankment, ladies and gents. And look at these sphinxes on the handles of these benches. People don't even notice them being there, but it's all part of dedication to Cleopatra's needle. What took so long to actually arrive here. So, we're going to head down now. I want to show you another amazing place to get a drink in London. And that is Tattersall's Castle. Now, this is probably one of the more popular pubs and restaurants on the River Thames. And actually, they do private parties on here as well. But let me have a look here. So, it's a floating pub and restaurant. Look at them all enjoying the few drinks out there look at your view in the background and originally served as a passenger ferry across the Humber estuary actually from 1934 to 1973 before it was finally towed here to London in 1976. So the steamer itself was built by William Gray and Company in 1934 and it was originally opened as a floating art gallery until 1982 when it was opened up as a restaurant. Now I'd love to see if they'll allow me to film on there but to be honest i think you'll get the idea you guys but a great place to have a drink here right look at your view in the background open seven days a week now we're going to head down here then as well because one of the most important memorials in london is coming up here the royal air force memorial now this is grade two listed and you'll see the stunning guild gold eagle on top this was designed by sir reginald bloomfield and it's actually dedicated to the memory of the casualties of the raf 
and the Royal Air Force in World War One. Here we have it here. And we get a better look in just a moment. We've just a few people here on the embankment. This is probably one of the busiest parts of London, especially on a beautiful day like today. Now, it was unveiled in 1923, ladies and gents. And the funds for this memorial were raised by the Royal Air Force Memorial Fund. Uh, the 16th of July, 1923, it was unveiled by, well, the then Prince of Wales, who later became Edward VIII. We're all familiar with it, absconded or abdicated the throne in favor of his love of Wallace Simpson. So the Gilded Eagle, which I'm trying to get the best view I can for you, was taken from the RAF badge. It's got raised wings facing east towards the River Thames and nominally towards France. The eagle itself was sculpted by William Reed Dick. And the motto of the Royal Air Force is also right at the top. And that reads, Per Ardu Ad Astra. Per Ardu Ad Astra. Apologies, I'm hoping I got that right. And that means through adversity to the stars. So very important memorial here on the embankment. This inscription is added in remembrance of those men and women of the air forces of every part of the British Commonwealth and Empire who gave their lives 1939 to 1945. Now our final stop is coming up in just a moment and this is for me personally the most requested memorial in London and a lot of my visitors whenever I take them on their private tours around the area always want to see this particular one and it is quite impressive it's coming up here very shortly and it's a memorial to the Battle of Britain and that brings us right down the back of the embankment they're all heading on the uber boats here ladies and gents don't forget we uh did an uber boat cruise i uh, took the clipper cyclone clipper you'll see it there oh i feel like some of them are getting on those high speed boats as well so this is one of the places you alight for the uber boats or the thames clipper it's a wonderful way to travel along the river thames so on we go i want to talk to you a little bit more about the oil air force monument the battle of britain uh, to the Battle of Britain, which took place on the 10th of July to the 31st of October, 1940. Now, the monument here commemorates the individuals who took part in the Battle of the Britain during the Second World War. It was unveiled on the 18th of September, 2005, on the 65th anniversary of the battle. So the bronze plaques we're about to see here, they list the 2,936 pilots and aircrew from 14 countries who took part in the battle on the Allied side. The sculpture of the monument is Paul Day. Look at this, isn't it just spectacular? Probably the most requested one that I get. And you'll see the airmen retreating to their airplanes. In this, the requested sculpture of the monument is Paul Day, and as I said, was cast by Morris Singer who is also responsible for the lines and the fountains of Trafalgar Square. So also known as the Monument to the Few, the centerpiece again is the scramble of the airmen running towards their planes. But of course this was the 2,936 British, European and Commonwealth airmen, 544, that lost their lives during the battle and a further 795 did not leave, live to see the final victory in 1945. It was the Battle of Britain, of course, that prompted Churchill to say, never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few. But an incredible dedication to those men and women who lost their lives in the Battle of Britain. Right, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to make my way back in here towards Big Ben. And we're going to head into Parliament because I have another special tour I'm preparing at the moment. But more importantly, again, thank you as ever for your wonderful support, ladies and gentlemen. 
I will continue to make the videos as long as you continue to want them. You're an amazing crew. Sinead signing out in here, here in London on the Victoria Embankment. Thanks for joining me. See you very soon.